Hi everyone, my name is Keenan, and today we're going to be covering gene transcription and more importantly specifically the process of initiation. This is really exciting stuff because this is the beginning of epigenetics, I would say. Now, there are different aspects of epigenetics, but I think we're going to be able to cover quite a few today while integrating kind of the important key aspects of this specific biological process here and see how they're important. So in this case, we're going to outline what are the key components that you need and what are their hierarchy when it comes to can we actually turn a gene on? Because that is exactly what we're going to do. In this case also, I want to make the point that the genome is an evolutionary tool, it's a trait, it's something that can respond to its environment much as, you know, much like the traits that it does code for. So we're gonna be going over that and I'm gonna see what everybody thinks on that once we get to the end. So this is kind of the challenge question that I'm gonna lead with, which is, if things have coding similarity up to almost an exact amount, why are things different? We're going to go through three specific examples in the live session, and I'm going to kind of challenge your concept of who holds the power, DNA, or the mechanisms that turn DNA on and off or dose it. Okay, so in blue is usually going to be anything that is either review information or it's going to be supplemental. Anything in red is going to be fair game on an exam or an assessment of some kind. So in this case, this is kind of covering what we have already covered from previous classes, the central dogma, which is you have DNA safely stored in a nucleus, at least in a eukaryote. This will be transcribed into RNA, and this is going to be translated into a protein. Okay, So getting to with this process right here, this is where we're going to be focusing. How do we initiate this process right here? This is essentially how you turn a gene on. Because once you have RNA, there are mechanisms that can, you know, cancel this RNA or, you know, splice it differently, things like that. But getting in and actually activating one of these genes in here is going to be the major key when it comes to which genes are on and which ones are off. Most people are going to assume that the only way to change an organism or change, you know, a gene or a DNA is that you have to mutate the DNA. In this case, this is just a simple graphic showing that when you have a normal gene or a typical one, you're gonna have a normal protein. They're gonna go through that dogma and everything's gonna be okay. If you mutate the DNA, you're going to have a strange protein with new functions or no function, or you're gonna end up just deleting that protein's function completely. For a long time, this was the dogma that, you know, this is the only way that things are different. We have different genetic mutations. To a degree, this is totally true. DNA is a very important blueprint, and these are massive changes that you're going to be, be seeing here when you do mutate DNA, for example but it is not the whole story by any means. So the first example that we can kind of look to are identical twins. In this case and in this graph right here, identical twins are represented in their frequency of sharing a certain trait. And in the double bar graph, in white, you have identical twins who share a pretty much 100% similarity genome, and then fraternal twins who, you know, just like normal siblings, about 50% similarity, but a constant environment. So in this case, these are going through traits and measuring who has the greater genetic influence and which traits are more environmental. You can look at things like height, a specific one that's interesting, schizophrenia. These all have more genetic influence. So twins that are completely genetically identical at the coding DNA level, they tend to share more of that, that trait than you would expect from a normal set of twins. So a good example of something that is 100 genetic you know, this is, there's no environmental influence here, blood type. You have a specific set of genes that are going to code for those receptors on the blood cells. That's it. Twins will have that about 100% of the time, if not just exactly 100%. Another thing on the other end is that something purely environmental, for example, is language fluency. You can take two identical twins, teach one German, teach one French. You will never know the difference because that is something purely environmental. This is different than just human capacity for language. Okay, this is where we get into complex traits. This is where we have things that are distinct. You know, there's not just an on or off of this trait. A good example of this is height, and that's where you can kind of start with a histogram right here. Most people are gonna be between, let's say, let's say most, you know, most human individuals are gonna be between 5'5 five five and let's say 5'11. Most people exist in this range. You have people that are very tall over here, people that are very short over here. The same thing happens 
with your immune system strength. Some people have hyperactive immune systems. Some have immunocompromised immune systems. Most of us exist in this population. Another good trait that you have is fear or startle response, and this is actually where a lot of epigenetics are studied. So this is, this is exciting, but kind of a good example, and we'll see how in the live session. So one way that DNA, and specifically genes, can be altered is the environment can be a trigger for certain traits, because the environment will influence the expression of certain genes. Expression of genes is the on and off pattern that you will see with genes, okay? So sometimes the environment, and in this case, when it is a certain temperature, these flowers are going to be pink. When it's another temperature, when it's colder or warmer, they're going to turn blue, or depending on your, on your colors, purple here, I would say. So the environment can influence phenotype. It can influence it based on turning on or off genes in a lot of cases, okay? So a good example, and this is true for humans just like any other animal, chronic or acute stress can actually trigger genes to turn on. Now that, that process to turn on genes means that we have to go from DNA to RNA. That's the initiation of transcription and you have to initiate that. One way you get that, for example, is stress. In a lot of people, you can sequence and find genes that have just simply never been activated, let's say in the neurological or HPA, you know, an endocrine pathway that controls behavior. In other individuals that have these genes, but they're inactive, if they undergo some kind of stress, that gene becomes active, for example. So this is a very good example of how the environment can trigger genetic activation. Basically, your genome is something that reacts to your environment. It is not a static thing that just sits there waiting and you're, you know, you're built in for your whole life. It has built-in measures to make sure that it can react. Okay. This is probably one of the more important slides. What really counts when you make an organism is the final proteins that are expressed. Okay. So taking a look at these two species, my Pomeranian scout and a wolf. The DNA, the physical coding DNA difference between these two animals is minute. Wolves are actually further diverged on a coding basis from coyotes than they are from dogs. And that's because of the aggressive selection that we put dogs through. But the coding genome between these two things is very, very similar. Okay. In this case, look to these three criteria when you're looking at does DNA tell the whole picture and really it doesn't. DNA is a blueprint, but it's how you use that blueprint that creates an organism. This first point is going to be really what we study today. How do you control what comes, goes on or off? That's important. Humans have 20,000 genes in them. Not all of your genes are active all the time. Another really good consideration is how much. Genes can turn on to a high quantity or they can be at a low quantity. This is where you can see, like we saw in that histogram, that really complex, you know, array of possible traits, especially ones that are determined by multiple genes that have multiple on and off or dosage patterns. The last one, and this is more complicated, when during development, specifically embryonic development, and the order and quantity at which genes are made and have activity, that is going to determine a lot. That actually probably determines a whole lot about how you get a phenotype like this after only, you know, a very small amount of aggressive selection that we've put wolves through. We can cover more on that later. So, this is kind of the checkpoint that we're at. You have a DNA blueprint, and that is really, really important. But this step right here, and deciding what genes are we actually going to activate in this organism, that's really, that's probably the most important step in this case. Now, this is a very good chance where, you know, we teach biology out of textbooks, but this is where you can defend, hey, I think this is more important, or I think the blueprint is more important. That's something that we'll kind of try and cover in the, in the live session. So again, this kind of recaps what we saw at the dog slide. What makes an organism and what makes a trait, let's say, you need the right genes at the right dosage at the right moment. That's how you make a trait. Okay, so let's get into how we you know, initiate what are the key ingredients to make sure this process happens as we want it to. Okay, so we've covered this a little bit, but DNA is incredibly long and you have about 4.7 billion nucleotides of DNA in all of your 10 trillion cells. You have to store those. That's where histones come in. 
They are large, positively charged proteins that wrap negative DNA around them. When it's wrapped like this, you can actually then start coiling up all these histones in this massive structure, this supercoil, and store massive lengths of DNA into our chromosomes. This is how you compact DNA. This is how you store it. It serves one other role too. One other very key role. To turn on a section of DNA, a gene, it has to be open. It has to be accessible physically for that process to happen. Some DNA is open. That's reflected in this region right here, for example. These genes are accessible. To get accessible genes, you need to acetylate your histones. What acetylation does is cancel the positive charge of histones, and that allows the negative charge DNA to just kind of float out a little bit. That's where you have active DNA, okay? You need to have things at least opened up a little bit so that you can literally just get into this gene and turn it on. The other hand is when you have histones that are, you know, either methylated or they're just really nice and positive. When DNA is tightly packed in histones, you can't physically get to it. You can't turn those genes on. There's not going to be an active gene in an area of the genome that is physically silenced, essentially. And that's, that's kind of the word that we use for it, is that when these histones pack in genes and they don't allow them to get accessed, that gene's off. This is your first step. This is your first criteria to meet can you turn on a gene? You have to be, it has to be physically available to do that. So this is highest on the hierarchy that we're going to talk about. Okay, so this is, this is more, this is getting more into science, a little heavier science. There are genes that are going to turn genes on. These are acetyltransferases, okay? So all of these genes are genes that add these acetyl groups. In this case, to the lysine amino acid of histones, what that does is cancel the grip that histones have on DNA so that you get a big section of DNA here that we can actually go in and turn on. Nope, oh, my arrow didn't work. Histone deacetylases. These are genes over here. They turn them off. These are proteins that turn genes off because they cancel this acetyl mark. When you cancel that mark, these histones get really tightly packed. As you can tell, there is no available unpacked DNA the same way there is up here. This is the basic criteria to get a gene on versus off. So let's say that you do have a gene that is open. The histone has released it and you're okay to bind it. Okay? You have two key elements of the DNA itself that are going to serve as docking sites for other proteins that are activators, you know, or transcription factors as we'll see. The first of these two sites is something called an enhancer. Enhancers are very far away from the actual gene that you are going to turn on but they are going to play a major role because activators need to bind their enhancer DNA. They are going to flip over here. The DNA will physically come over here and it will bind up the complex of transcription factors, which are big proteins that activate the gene here. Transcription factors are going to be binding to this promoter, but they need this enhancer region to essentially finish that process. So you need two things here. You need to have transcription factors that are going to bind the promoter. You need activators that are going to bind your enhancer. These two things are going to come together, and that's when you start allowing the RNA polymerase to show up. RNA polymerase is the key to turning on the gene. This is when things are really going to start. Okay. Importantly, too, we talk about mutations and how they exist and change genes. If you mutate this DNA region or this DNA region, you could lose or lose dosage of a gene just as bad as if, as if you delete it or you have a mutation in the coding gene itself. Okay. This is just a good closer look at the supplement. Here's RNA polymerase. One of the things that it's going to do once it's attracted to this region, here the, here's that promoter region right here. It has physical spots on its protein that are going to serve as kind of like active sites, right? These proteins in yellow right here, they have amino acid compositions that are going to nicely fit this region right here, and it's going to bind to the chemistry of these nucleotides right here and right here. That's how it's physically going to be attracted to that spot. Okay. The next figures probably are most important when it comes to meeting that first objective. What are the criteria for an open gene? What is, what is a gene that is open for business and it is turned on? First off, you have to have that gene physically open. The histones have to be spread away. Okay. 
Next, you have to find as many of these DNA enhancer regions as you need, and their activator proteins have to be present, bind the DNA enhancer. That is going to flip the DNA over to this direction. Okay, So you have to bend the DNA over here. Now next, transcription factors. These are proteins that activate genes, Okay, and there are big collections of them. Different collections will bind different promoters and activate different genes at different levels and quantities. For the purposes of our class, we are just going to call them transcription factors, and that's it, okay? They're the ones that are binding this promoter right here, and they are the final step you need. But to get the transcription factors, you need the activators to attract them. So that's kind of why we have a stepwise thing here. Now, not every gene does this, but this is a very good background for it. When you have all these ingredients set up, finally, at five, the RNA polymerase here in yellow will actually show up it is going to turn on the gene. It's going to make it into RNA, and you will have an active gene. That is the step that it takes to get a gene on versus off. Okay. Some of the best research that is emerging is these, con these DNA contact regions. These are enhancers, like we talked about. So A and B right here, that we're seeing right here, we, can, we have technology called high c that can actually map that, for example, here, B region, is coming into close contact with A region. See how these are going to meet up here in the middle? So we're finding that a lot of the DNA that is not actually like a coding gene, when you change it though, it ruins genes all over the body because this isn't junk DNA. It's a vital enhancer or an activator of other genes. And this dance that DNA can perform is immensely complicated and exciting because sometimes it doesn't even have to be on the same chromosome. You have other chromosomes from other regions sometimes serving as enhancers. How, neat, how crazy is that? That this could be from another chromosome, right? So that's why the whole idea of junk DNA is kind of getting thrown out the window. Okay, the last thing that I want to cover. All that transcription activation machinery that you just saw, that's all well and good, unless you have what we call a repressor. Okay? What repressor proteins do is they bind something similar to a promoter region that RNA polymerase and the transcription factors are going to bind to. They're going to bind something called an operator. The operator is going to attract this red repressor, and it's going to bind it. The repressor physically gets in the way of transcription factors or RNA polymerase itself, and it binds up the beginning of the chain. And as you can tell, if a repressor is physically in the way, you cannot have any RNA. So let's diagnose where this fits in in the hierarchy of these ingredients. Okay, this is a very good overview of everything. As you can tell, sometimes you have multiple activators, and this is the first time that I want to introduce, this is how you have different gene dosages, because you can have different levels of activators, right? So in this case, you have two activators, no repressor, everything's good. You got a lot of transcription because you got two activators happening, right? If you have one activator, you probably have a little bit of transcription, but this is where you get the idea that, you know, certain genes and their quantity can be a little different, right? If you have a repressor, though, most of the time, you are not going to be able to overcome that. These two are not going to be able to get past this repressor. So when a repressor is present, even if you have every other ingredient ready, it will likely block transcription, and this gene is off. So remember that repressors have a lot more power when it comes to their role than the activators do. All right, so this is probably where we're going to start kind of prepping for that discussion that we'll have in the live session. These genes, you know, your, your genome is found in every one of your cells. Every one of these cells has the exact same genome, yet, like it says on the bottom, they have very different phenotypes. And that kind of addresses the question that we talked about at the beginning, which is, how is that possible? How is it possible that the same exact DNA is going to lead to something so wildly, wildly different? And trust me, the human body is super, super complex and incredible when it comes to the diversity of phenotypes that your cells can have with the same exact information that they're given. And it all comes down to what genes are on, what quantity, and what basically sequence do they turn on or off in, okay? And every gene can control that by having different sets of transcription activators, different sets of repressors, different patterns of acetylation on and off patterns, right? Certain regions of DNA are just closed for business in a lot of these cells. And that's how you get a, an incredibly complex organism like us, you know, for the most part. Not to toot our horn more than we already do.
So, I like covering things from a eukaryotic perspective because I'm more of a disease, disease biologist, but I have a lot of respect for how bacteria do things. And this is something that we can cover in a live, in a live session too. Bacteria are way more adaptable than eukaryotes. They have a single cell. They have multiple genetic sources of genetic information. But for the most part, the way that they can be so reactive to their environment, they can completely just completely change the genes that they want on because their nucleus is just sitting out right in the open. There's no complexity. There's way less, basically, check signals that you have to make to transcribe a gene on in a bacteria than you do in a eukaryote. For example, they don't really have the same histones that we have. They don't, they don't overcomplicate their genome. If they receive a stress signal from their environment, some kind of something's attacking them, something like that, they immediately start making the genes to respond to that challenge. In terms of evolution, this is an incredible advantage, right? They can immediately start adapting and changing without having and spreading progeny like we've talked about with evolution. You know, most evolution we talk about, oh, you need this massive population or you just need an organism like a bacteria that can activate multiple genes at multiple times in real time. Humans don't have that exact same capability. Like we talked about in the beginning, the environment can trigger us to have certain effects, but it's not going to be quite as quick as bacteria. So we'll talk about these. Awesome. And this is kind of the end right here. I want you to think about these before we show up and talk. Um, you know, I really, you know, this, this material for me is really exciting because it goes so far beyond the black and white that the genome sometimes has been presented as in the last 20 years. And as a cancer biologist myself, it's really interesting to address the cancer question from this perspective. How can cancer cells so wildly aggressive and different have the same basic coding genome as a normal cell? And when you look at all the changes that are actually going on, you see that that on and off pattern of genes and the dosages of certain genes that are on, that's what's controlling a lot of these things. So I'm excited to talk with everybody and I have some other uh, fun discussions that I think we're going to enjoy. So I'll talk to you then.